So before we get started, I just wanted to say we're continually reminded of how amazing the Film Riot community is and how much it just blows our mind. The community that has been built around this show, thanks to you guys. And last week's episode was a big reminder of that for us because in the comment section of last week's episode, you guys really showed up with some wonderfully kind and encouraging words. I really appreciate that. That stuff is like fuel for us to keep going. Seeing that the things that we hoped this show would turn into, it actually is, and that it's a affecting you guys in the same way it's affecting us. It's it's become this really great relationship where you guys have encouraged and built us up as much as we hopefully have done for you. So again, thank you for that. But another thing we saw asked a whole lot in the comment section of last week's episode, which of course that episode was all about clarifying the different levels of budget, is how we get our budgets for our film and make that money back. First, I wanted to start with how we make our money back from short film, since I think that leads into how we get get the money and the answer to the question of how we make our money back is 90% of the time we don't make money on short films. I think some people have been able to, but that is not the norm for sure. There are definitely things that you can try to do to bring in some revenue to offset the cost of your film, and depending on the cost to begin with, maybe some extra money on top of that. And those are things like submitting the footage from your film to be sold as stock footage or stock images, stock music if you made all the music yourself, any assets you made for the films like VFX assets, anything custom that you can put up as a pack to sell to try to recoup that cost or there's also on-demand services that will put your film on places like Amazon and you can get some revenue from the streaming there although it's usually pretty minuscule. You can also monetize your film which I would only do this through ads like you get on YouTube. I would personally never put anything up for rent since I don't think almost anyone is going to pay to watch a short film like 99% of the time and that's the whole point of making a short film in my opinion is to get your work out there and show what you're capable of. But for me personally, I don't even like to monetize our films on YouTube. It's a bit distracting, I think, and it doesn't really make that much money anyway. For instance, this episode of Film Riot that was monetized and hit 1 million views only made a little bit over a thousand dollars and that's with a million views. Now there have been episodes that hit that amount of money with just half those views because YouTube is confusing, but it's not something that I would count on because it's so unpredictable. Some of the things that I have personally done to try to recoup some of that cost is sell some posters or our onset experience packs that have a lot of special features on how we made our films. These have helped to recoup a little bit, but I've never really made my money back. For me, making all these short films, like I said last week, are, they're just passion projects. One that my cast, crew, and I come together to make and invest in ourselves. We do the work so we can gain more experience and create calling cards for what we can do as artists that will hopefully take us to the next stage of the thing we're really wanting to do. Because like I said on the show before, no one's going to invest in you if you aren't willing to first invest in yourself. Of course, that doesn't necessarily have to mean money. That can also just mean time. Often, it does just mean time and effort. You can't do great things with little to no resources. But now let's move into how I get the money for my films. And for that, I want to take a look at a few different films, starting out with one of my early public short films, which is Tell. Tell cost me somewhere in the area of $2,000, and since my entire crew was just family and friends willing to spend their weekends helping me, and the locations were my girlfriend's house and my parents' house, all the money went to cast, travel expenses, for the cast, food, props, gear, makeup, and wardrobe, and I got this budget in a very stupid way that I do not recommend you doing, which was all by maxing out a credit card, which then took me almost a year to pay off. So again, definitely isn't something I would recommend doing. Then of course there were a couple of those hundred dollar type films which I did pay for myself but after a while I wanted to take on bigger projects to build my experience and have larger crews and those budgets were not sizes that I could take on alone. So that's where our partners came in and that was for films like Ghost House, Chainsaw, and Ballistic. For those I went to people who believed in us, who got what we were trying to do with Film Riot and most importantly had gear and software that I would be using on the show and showing you guys that we did use with or without their help on the project. And for me, that's key. If you're going to try to go this route, I think authenticity really is very important. Whenever I've gone to a company, my pitch is always the same. I'm going to be using your stuff either way, but do you want to help us make this the best it can be? And to the credit of many of these companies, they decided to help. And in fact, some of them said no, and I still use their gear and show it on the show. And people said that we got paid to do it. 
when we never did. They said no. Now, I totally understand that I'm in a unique and very lucky position that I very much appreciate with Film Riot and all of you that does give me the ability to bring in companies like that. So the approach is definitely different and not really a realistic one if you don't have a following, but you never know until you try. One option for you could be going for a lower dollar amount and just one company that you really believe in. What could make it worth it for them is content. Everyone is always looking for content, either to show off what their gear or software is capable of or just to draw eyes to what they're doing as a whole. Before I had much of a following at all, that's actually exactly what I did and Let Us Direct hooked us up with some gear that we wouldn't have had otherwise and we didn't have an audience at the time they just hooked us up so they could get content out of it. Now, if you are gonna do that, you of course need to have something that you can show them from your work, which is where investing in yourself first comes in. So all of this is assuming you've already put in those 10,000 plus hours to get to this point. But even with all that and the partners, I've always put my own money into every project that I've ever done, which is why I've just never really made my money back. But another person who has gone a similar way as what I'm talking about here is Seth Worley. In 2010, I was working a full-time job as a video producer at a large publishing company on their events team where I was churning out videos for their various conferences and summer camps. Everything I made at this job, I would post on my Vimeo account and I uh, would note in the descriptions what gear and software I'd use to make it, uh, which I mostly just did to show off, but it ended up also getting me noticed by one of the companies whose products I was using, Red Giant. Uh, one day, I got an email from a guy named Arne Rabinowitz saying, hey, I'm the head of marketing at Red Giant and I just watched Adventure Now. So Arne had watched it and he was interested in making an original short that could serve as a marketing tool for Red Giant. Something that stood on its own as a narrative short, but had a behind the scenes piece attached to it that could show off how Red Giant products were integral in executing it. Arn's budget was 10 grand, which for how ambitious the short was going to be was really tight. But Arn said, and this was the thing that was more powerful than money, he said, you can give out as much free software uh, as you want, which meant we could offer to pay people in free software. Software which was valued at thousands and thousands of dollars. Without this, we couldn't have made plot device for $10,000. Even writing it around available resources like my brother, my parents' house, props from old videos, including a yellow button we had sitting around our office. Despite all of our practicality, it still came down to paying people for their time and the software is what gave us the power to do that. This only really works once, by the way. Uh, once people have the software, it doesn't really work anymore. Again, mine and Seth's paths are somewhat unique and specific. Something more common nowadays is something like crowdfunding, which I think has plenty of pitfalls of its own and a very small chance of of success if you're being realistic. And again, isn't something that you should even consider trying unless you can show people what you're capable of delivering first. But since I have never done a Kickstarter myself, I asked my friend Ryan Polly to talk a bit about his experience. Every film that I've directed has been self-funded, but with Pizza Time, my latest short, we decided to take a different approach. So to do the concept justice, I knew that we needed a bigger budget. So we decided to go to Kickstarter. We ended up raising about $19,000 on Kickstarter. And with some of the personal money that I put in, as well as the money that Maker Table, our production company put in, we ended up having a budget of about $35,000. Pizza Time was my first Kickstarter, and I knew that I needed to put a ton of time and research into making it successful. So I looked at other successful Kickstarter films and studied their campaigns. What did they do right? What did they do wrong? Now Kickstarter is all or nothing. So that means that whatever money you set at the beginning of your campaign, you have to reach that goal in order to get your money. That created a lot of pressure for me, but it's pressure that I needed because I was really kind of treating this Kickstarter like a full-time job, putting a ton of time and research into making sure it was a successful campaign. You really wanna make sure that the rewards that you give out are realistic for your campaign. For us, we gave a lot of digital rewards out, but we also had a few physical rewards like pins and posters that are gonna be a little bit more expensive and eat into the budget that we set out to get for the Kickstarter. You really need to be smart with those rewards, look at your budget, and see at the beginning of your campaign what that money is gonna go towards. So what I've heard from Polly and everyone else that I know who's done a Kickstarter say that it really is like starting another business altogether and if you are going to go that route, you gotta make sure that you're able to pull it off the way that you say you can and deliver what you say you can to your contributors. Another unique perspective comes from Colin Levy. Colin is a filmmaker that's done several short films, but most recently Skywatch, which I'm sure a lot of you have already seen. He had a very large production that spanned years and had, you know, Jude Law. I've probably made 30 or so shorts over the last 15 or 16 years that really run the gamut in terms of scope and scale and production value. <laughs> my first shorts, of course, were terrible and were made for no money. And my latest short, Skywatch, which I released on YouTube a couple months ago, had a budget of north of $100,000, which is a lot of money. Um, this project wouldn't have been possible without all the ones that came before. I found, like, in general, I've sort of been leveraging 
the work I've just completed to do whatever is next. I made a film called Suburban Plight in high school that literally starred my dad. I shot it in my backyard. Probably had a budget of 15 bucks, but it came out well. And that's crucial to this whole narrative because once you're convincing people down the line to help you out, they're gonna look at that previous work and make a determination. How do you make good stuff without resources? Well, for me, the secret weapon has been time. I spent a year and a half on that six minute short in high school, shooting, going back and editing, realizing what I needed, going back out, shooting more for free, because it's my dad and I can grab him and force him to do stuff. No, but that's not what Astonished looks like. <laughs> Let me see you be Astonished. Fast forward a few years, I made a movie called En Route in film school. We had a budget of $3,000, and in this film, which was about an airline pilot, we had three or four different types of aircraft. We got two fire trucks and an ambulance for nothing. Our budget almost exclusively went to food. Again, we were able to do a lot with a little, and where did the money come from? In that case, my own pockets. But to make that project happen, I was literally pointing to, to Suburban Plight, my high school movie, and saying, hey, look, I made this. Don't you want to help me make my next thing? <laughs> so in 2009, I got involved in a project that I did not put together myself, but I was hired to direct. Literally half the budget came from DVD pre-sales. For them, it was very crucial to build an online community. That has also been pretty crucial for me, I have to say. People who've kind of followed my work and a lot of those people have ended up supporting it uh, financially. When I did my first Kickstarter in 2011, again, I was pointing to Sintel. I was pointing to En Route. We were able to raise uh, over $10,000 and that became the entire budget for my senior film in film school. And then just to skip right ahead to Skywatch, this project project was different from anything I've done before because we actually found independent financing, which never happens because you can't make money on narrative shorts. This one is a little bit different because it was a proof of concept. It was designed to essentially sell. It's a sales tool for a feature film. How did I find the money for Skywatch? Well, again, it was because of my previous work. Production on this film was entirely financed by a guy who I maybe had met one time. He reached out years prior via email because he was a fan of my previous work. He wanted me to potentially get involved in a different project in something he was writing and putting together, but essentially fostering that relationship, keeping him posted. You know, I know this didn't work out, but I have a sci-fi proof of concept short that I'd love to make. Let me tell you about it. Fortunately, he, he came on board and that got us through uh, the week of production in 2014. And then again, I pulled out my secret weapon, which is time and spent years in post chipping away, doing targeted reshoots for no money on my own gear. And eventually um, it was going so slowly we decided to do a Kickstarter. But because of my previous Kickstarter, I could point to that and say, hey look, well, I did this Kickstarter, which was successful. Watch the movie, it's pretty good. It got a Vimeo staff pick. Don't you wanna help me make my next thing? So you have to start small and everyone does. And over time, it doesn't happen overnight. But as you improve, as your work improves, as your relationships grow, it is possible to be doing work at a higher level without necessarily having a bunch of cash in your own bank account. <laughs> I'm gonna need some tech support. So there are a lot of avenues you can take to make your film happen and getting a budget for your production is great. But to close us out, I wanted to emphasize the point of our last episode. Most of my short films have been made for little to no money at all. And that's not even counting all the shorts I did before Film Riot. All of those were home video cameras done for zero dollars. I think it's really important to remember that while getting a budget is great, it's not mandatory for making something great. You can spend next to nothing or literally nothing and still make something that will get you into Hollywood making massive feature films like Shazam. To prove my point, here's someone who did exactly that. When Lotta and I made our horror shorts, we didn't have any budgets. We had tried a couple of times to get grant money, but were unsuccessful. So, for example, when we made Lights Out, we had to make do with what we had. And we did have some things. I had recently done a paying job that enabled me to buy a Blackmagic camera. And to light it, I had bought a couple of cheap knockoff redhead lights on eBay from China that I made sure to turn off between every take because I was afraid that they were gonna catch fire. Uh, in fact, there's a moment in Lights Out when you hear this electric buzzing sound. 
that was recorded from those lights. And we had a Ikea paper lantern and a 300 watt photography bulb that I found on a flea market for like a dollar. Why a 300 watt bulb for that? Well, I wanted to make sure that we could shoot really low ISO and get really clean images with all the darkness. And for dolly moves, I built my own dolly. Went to Ikea to their bargain section and found a piece of shelving that I could put skateboard wheels on and then use PVC pipes as tracks. And we didn't record any sound. That was all done in post because we didn't really have any dialogue and that gives you more control. You know, every little creaky footstep in that film I selected and placed by hand. And it was all finished in Resolve, which is free. And for the audio, I used Reaper, which is very affordable audio software. And for the monster at the end, that was a combination of Photoshop and Blender. Blender's free, Photoshop's not, but there are some open source alternatives like Krita or Gimp. So it was a very low budget affair. But the thing I've learned about the difference between professional tools and the DIY no budget tools is basically two things. I mean, one is reliability. You know, professional gear will just take a beating and go on forever. While, you know, my dolly, you look at it wrong, it'll fall apart. And the other thing is sort of ease of use or, or frustration because, you know, professional gear just works. Really cheap gear, you run into problems. Like when I w was buying rods to, to rig out my camera, I bought really cheap ones that were not made to spec, so they didn't quite fit and I had to use a hammer. And like my ND filter had like an open door policy for UV light, so sometimes I would get really red footage and had to work with that in post. And this monitor turns into a mirror in sunlight. So cheap gear will cause frustration and take a lot of extra time. But the big advantage when you're making zero budget shorts is that for you, time is not really money. If your dolly requires extra takes to get it just right, you can do that. And if something doesn't work, you can like, oh, let's try it again tomorrow or, or the next weekend or whenever we have the time, you know? As long as you're willing and able to, you know, spend the time and effort and you don't mind dealing with frustration, you can do a lot of cool stuff with very little money. It just won't be easy. Big thank you to all my friends who took their time to send in their experiences. Please check out the links in the notes below to see their films. Each one of them is immensely talented and all of them have great educational content as well. So definitely check those out. And until next time, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.